Now, having worked in multiple industries, I've gotten to see a lot of cool things. Uh, I've got to hold a million dollar blue diamond in my hand, several stories under uh, the ground in Manhattan. I've been uh, literally on the flight line loading bombs onto Top Gun pilots for the Navy and just been in a lot of cool situations and been able to see stuff. And so the example that I'm going to use today is, is one of my clients, uh, Denver Water, uh, that I worked with. And I, I just think it, the analogy works well. You know, when we talk about lean, we talk about flow. And what we want to do um, in product development is, is keep to maintain that flow. So Denver Water, they collect the snow melt that comes off of off of the mountains and they collect them in, in reservoirs. And so this water is, is stored here. It goes through a water treatment process and typical water treatment processes have four steps. And then it comes out of the water treatment process. Eventually it goes to a faucet and right into your cup or jug or whatever you need it to do. So we can look at this entire process um, as, as equal to product development. Now, as I mentioned, we're really today going to focus on the front half of this. So we're going to worry about this part of the product development or process development system the snow melting snow coming in, the reservoir, and uh, initial pre-treatment. For several years, I competed in triathlons. This medal is what I got after I finished my first Ironman. Uh, this race was a 2.4 mile swim, 112 mile bike, followed by a 26.2 marathon at the end. It took about 10 hours and 57 minutes for me to finish this race. And so like product development, there's a significant amount of time where we're exerting effort to get something done. Now, I was fortunate to go on uh, and complete two other Ironman races, uh, one in North Carolina and one in Maryland. And then that led me to be able to compete in something called the Ultraman. And Ultraman is a three-day race. Day one's a 6.2-mile swim with a 90-mile bike. Day two is a 170-mile bike. And then day three is a double marathon, about 52 and a half miles. And so training for this requires a, a very specific level of training of endurance to be able to get done in time. But certainly the most difficult of the races that I had was not just endurance, but doing speed. Uh, this is a, a medal from one of the Ironman 70.3 World Championships that I got to do. Now this race is shorter uh, in the four to five hour range, um, but far fewer than 1% of the athletes that compete and these races get invited to this race. So how do you combine high levels of endurance with high levels of speed? And one of the things that uh, in the endurance industry is this concept of heart rate training. And if you can master the heart rate training, you can best create your body to uh, compete in these long races. And one of the things that they do is they put, if you look, if you, uh, you know, wear a heart rate monitor or strap around your chest, you can see during the race, your, your heart follows some type of curve. And when we look at heart rate training, they like to divide it into five zones. So zone one would be basic activity, starting to get your heart going. Zone two is uh, aerobic activity. Um, this is where your body is metabolizing fat as an energy source. Uh, zone three is you've elevated your heart rate. You're using the glycogen that's stored in. Maximum exertion for zone three is a couple of hours. So just recently we had the guy break the two hour uh, barrier for the marathon. He was operating uh, in zone three. Zone four begins to be uh, anaerobic. And, uh, and then zone five is, is max. So in zone four, your body starts to produce uh, higher levels of lactic acid. In zone five, your body can't dump it um, with both of these. It just simply can't get rid of it fast enough, and that builds out and you wear out very quickly. So zone four is minutes. Zone five is seconds that you're able to do that. So when we're looking at a graph like this, we really don't want to train in zone three. There are no 
physiological advantages to operating in a zone three over a zone two. With the exception of, if we were to do a training session, we may want to have a peak up to zone four, followed by a recovery, followed by another short peak and a recovery, because we want to give the, the body a chance to dump that lactic acid. That slows recovery. It prevents uh, longer bursts of energy. So when we look at these periods of recovery, they're just as critical as these periods where we're developing our speed. And there are exact correlations uh, to this in the development process. Now, we're not gonna say, are you in zone one, zone two, zone three? We don't have heart rate monitors that we can wear in the development process, but we can look at the exertion level of our employees and we can tell where are they operating? Are they operating something at a level where they can burn out in days? Is this something where they can burn out in weeks or months? No, we want people to be able to go years. So we can do some interval training, when we have our you know, high burst levels of just before launch or just before prototype creation or some things that we can peak up, but we need to bring that recovery level down way low, not rest. Uh, you know, at rest level would be, this, would be this baseline. So when we're doing Ironman training, most of the time we wanna be in one or two because it is so long and because development is over multiple months, even if we're using Agile methodology, that's, that's an infinite, there is an infinite timeline. We're always releasing something. So we can't operate at this peak up here. And when we do have our bursts, we need to be able to do them smoothly, efficiently, and get, uh, get the recovery we need to, to be able to do those again. Okay, so I'm sharing three things with you today on slowing down to speed up. The first thing that, that we need to make sure that we're doing is we're controlling the cue. Now I'm just gonna write the letter Q is for Q, but this is the backlog of ideas. So if we're using the Denver water example, this is the reservoir. Okay, it's where the water is collected. It's before it even gets into the water treatment process. It's this hold of information that's sitting here. So this would be equivalent to what are the project ideas? Okay, and these project ideas come from everywhere. You've got customers making requests, you've got executives uh, making requests, you've got new technology people uh, inserting things, marketing, uh, salespeople, uh, just a ton of ideas that are coming in. Now, the higher this water goes, the higher the pressure is at the bottom, right? Every foot, we've got another half a PSI, that's, that's being built up. And we know that that pressure rolls downhill, right? So in a development process, we've got a cross-functional organization uh, with people representing the different areas. And then ultimately that pressure is getting down to these people at the bottom who are doing the design work. So the higher this is going, the bigger the reservoir, it's not good for product development because we need to maintain flow. And eventually, when it gets too high, water will come over the top and go over the spillway and that's lost to the product development process forever. So, let's go to an example that we face every day outside of work. And so I, I live in Columbus, Ohio. So our downtown is right in the, right in the center of a, an outer loop and we can look at the northbound, uh, southbound traffic in the morning, the eastbound traffic in the morning, the stuff that we have coming in from the south. So each of these inflow areas are extremely busy in the morning time. And in the evening, it reverses and the arrows go the other way. Now, Google has a pretty cool feature that you can get on and you can overlay their traffic and you can slide the slider based on time of day and see where those intense uh, traffic periods are. Now, during the middle of the daytime, you have no traffic and you can go wherever you want. But the second uh, we add rush hour starts to back up. And if we add anything like rain, if we add snow, or we add you know, a police car on the side of the road, 
uh, that someone's pulled over with an accident, we can cause the city traffic to shut down. I was stuck uh, in a shutdown uh, last week where there was a shooter on the north side and 